begins now. Okay, for today's session, we're going to cover the following issues. First, as we always do, we're going to provide an overview of recent developments in the crisis over U Ukraine. We're going to provide a summary of the major developments since Russia invaded last week. A lot's happened, especially regarding Western reaction to try and punish Russia for the invasion and Ukraine's rather successful initial resistance to that invasion. Next, we'll concentrate on the West's reaction to the Russian invasion, paying particular attention to the significant actions taken by European countries to confront Russia. European unity around a set of very strong uh, package of economic sanctions and military assistance to Ukraine has been one of the most important developments in this early stage of the war. In this section on European moves, we're first going to discuss the evolution of the sanctions themselves and then discuss how the European Union emerged as a major international player in the conflict, in the conflict so far. After that, we're going to look back at the impact that the economic sanctions have already begun to have on the Russian economy and how they may affect Russia in the weeks, months, and even years to come. We'll also look at some of the limit, limitations of sanctions when it actually comes to changing the calculus and decision-making of Vladimir Putin and the behavior of the Russian military on the battlefield in Ukraine. After our discussion of sanctions, we will summarize the status of the military conflict on the ground in Ukraine, looking at how Ukraine has initially been relatively successful in resisting the Russian invasion but also noting how Russia has adapted and has already started adopting more destructive tactics to correct for some of their early military setbacks. And finally, we end with a short discussion of how Russia's invasion has intersected with U.S. domestic politics by analyzing President Biden's State of the Union address and some very preliminary surveys on a U.S. public opinion on the Ukraine crisis now that Russia has invaded. Okay. So we want to start today with a discussion of recent events surrounding the first week or so of the invasion. And so the invasion and the West's strong and unified response to Russia's in, uh, attack surprised many, including probably Vladimir Putin. And we will talk a lot about that. At the same time, Russia has already seen to adapt its military strategy, as Professor McDonald's already said, and escalated the conflict even further. And so we're going to start with a news clip from the PBS NewsHour. And, and I want to put in a warning here that this clip has some graphic images and some, some um, footage from the war that might be uh, disturbing. So, so please uh, know about that. And, and this clip is going to highlight the, the most recent, at least for us, this is from last night or, uh, or so, uh, so about midweek Wednesday. Uh, of the most recent events in this conflict. So go ahead and run that clip now. Russian forces pounded cities in Ukraine today as the war raged for a sixth day. Kharkiv in the northeast was particularly hard hit, and the port city of Mariupol in the southeast appeared surrounded. Nevertheless, a drive by Russian forces toward the capital, Kyiv, appears to be stalled. According to the Pentagon, and Ukrainian forces kept up their fierce resistance. Again tonight, our Nick Schifrin begins our coverage from Lviv. For years, Moscow's military has employed scorched earth. Today, it brought that brutal reality to Ukraine. Kharkiv's central square, named Freedom, now mostly rubble and dust. Inside the city's main government building, emergency workers removed debris and carried dead bodies. In total, city authorities said at least five were killed and more than two dozen wounded, all civilians. Surveillance footage captured the attack, a direct hit, and a massive fireball. Russia promised its targets would be restricted to military. This is a residential building, homes completely destroyed, families and children killed. We're being bombed by the Russians. We're all afraid. Why us? We're all simple civilians. They destroyed a residential building. The rockets hit and many peaceful residents died. Putin and Lavrov are bandits and should be tried. 300 miles away in Kyiv, Russian missiles hit the city's main radio and TV tower. 
Firefighters fought to extinguish the fire at the site that's near a memorial to Ukrainian Jews killed by Nazis in World War II. Ukrainian President Zelensky today called this history repeating itself. Outside the city, satellite images show a convoy even larger than previously believed, 40 miles long. But a senior defense official said today the advance toward Kyiv was stalled. The official said Russia wants to encircle Kharkiv. Russian troops have begun to occupy cities in the south, Berdyansk and Melitopol, and are just outside Mariupol. But once again, Zelensky remained defiant, this time to European lawmakers. Even the interpreter got emotional. We are fighting just for our land and for our freedom. Despite the fact that all large cities of our country are now blocked, believe you me, every square up to date, no matter what it's called, it's going to be called, as today, Freedom Square in every city of our country. Today, ordinary Ukrainians fought for their freedom despite being outgunned. Civilians tried to stop Russian armored vehicles, their only weapons, their bodies. Across the country, Ukrainians are rallying, even though some of their cities are slowly being strangled. Okay, so this is uh, a clip from the sort of last days of the first week of the conflict. And so let me just take a step back here and, and lay out a timeline of how events unfolded from the beginning of the invasion uh, up until uh, the end of the first week. And so uh, the... The invasion really starts with Russia acknowledging and, and, and declaring basically the independence of two regions in eastern Ukraine, that uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, as independent. And then in, on February 24th, the Russian military starts to enter Ukrainian territory and invade. And, and initially, this invasion is sort of limited to eastern Ukraine. And because it's limited to eastern Ukraine and there had, they had, Russia hadn't started its all-out assault, the West uh, provided a relatively limited response at first to this incursion into Ukrainian territory. And so uh, some Western leaders uh, re kind of refrained from using the word invasion um, to describe this because... Russia had entered into territory that was already held by Russian-backed separatists. And the West did impose some sanctions, but the sanctions were uh, rather limited and didn't include the full slate of sanctions we're going to talk about in a second, and really uh, were relatively weak in terms of the response that uh, a lot of people expected. In terms of the comparison of this first initial um, set of sanctions and what was threatened by President Biden and uh, the West in terms of uh, dramatic and, and severe economic sanctions. And so there was a bit of a disappointment, I would say, from commentators, from some of the press, that uh, really what made, was made clear when President Biden gave a news conference describing these uh, sanctions and defending them is, is really severe. A lot of people ask, well, why aren't you uh, personally sanctioning Vladimir Putin? That wasn't part of it. Why wasn't Russia kicked off of the SWIFT international banking system? That wasn't part of it yet. And so, so this limited response was the way that the, it started. And, and so there was a lot of concern about that. But then Russia expanded its invasion uh, of Ukraine into an all-out uh, attack from three different directions throughout the country with a clear aim to uh, topple the government of Ukraine and to uh, take over the country, it seemed. And so because of this expanded attack, that, and that happened, you know, literally a day or two, uh, started to happen a day or two later, um, the United States and Europe came back with much stronger sanctions that uh, included the whole range of actions that we're going to talk about in a second, but included a full set of um, economic sanctions that a lot of commentators have been describing as economic warfare, plus uh, a package of uh, military assistance that really uh, outmatched what had been done before. 
Uh, and so that's how the invasion starts, right? It, the, R Russia expanded its uh, attack and it's, it's falls into a full-scale invasion, and then Russia and, the, and Europe P and its European allies expanded its retaliation. And then the next really key uh, element of this uh, conflict is is Ukraine itself and, and Ukrainian military and civilian resistance, which proved to be surprisingly effective and strong in its resistance to uh, the Russian invasion. And so uh, there was an expectation by a lot of commentators, and, and clear, and it seemed that an expectation by the Russian military itself that the Ukraine military wouldn't withstand this all-out attack of, of 100,000 and more, 150,000 Russian troops, um, and it would uh, either surrender or collapse pretty quickly, and that the government uh, in Kyiv would collapse as well. But that none of those things happened. And the uh, Ukrainian forces fought really um, strongly and uh, caused a lot of damage to the Russian uh, material. Uh, military, a lot of casualties were uh, estimated to have occurred, and most importantly, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, the, this strong resistance mobilized global public opinion uh, in favor of Ukraine and away from Russia. And then you get to this sort of final stage of this first week, and that is this um, change of tactics that we'll talk uh, in more detail about later in this episode of Russia escalating the conflict, targeting more civilian areas uh, to sort of uh, change the, their approach so that they could um, eventually take over these urban centers and accomplish their military goals, including toppling the government and uh, taking more territory. In the process, in just this first week, and, and this can't be emphasized enough, there has been a humanitarian, you know, tragedy. There are now more than one million refugees in seven days fleeing Ukraine. Uh, this is going to grow exponentially over time, especially if Russia increases its heavy artillery, aerial bombardment of, of uh, densely populated urban areas. And so, so basically that's um, the evolution of the conflict so far. Yeah, and we should just emphasize too here that this is a concerted military strategy on the part of Putin to bomb civilian targets and to stimulate refugee flows, push as many Ukrainians out of Ukraine as possible into Europe, and at the same time put pressure on European countries that are receiving these refugees right. from taking in millions of Ukrainians. So this is also designed to, to chip at uh, Western unity as well. Right. Okay, so let's start to take a closer look at how the West reacted to Russia's invasion. And we're gonna start by listening to an audio clip from the New York Times, the Daily Podcast. So let's go ahead and run that clip now. The measures that the European Union has taken against Russia for the invasion of Ukraine are frankly stunning. As Russian forces unleash their assault on Kiev and other Ukrainian cities, we are resolved to continue imposing massive costs on Russia. The most useful way to look at them is to sort of divide them in two categories, one being broadly economic and the other being not economic. Bottom line, it's pretty clear. These are big and staggering penalties, sanctions. It's hurting the so financial system. when it comes to the economy, their actions go after powerful individuals, including Vladimir Putin himself. And in the European Union decided to freeze Putin's and Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's assets. That's a very, very unusual move. More oligarchs added to the EU sanctions list yesterday. We had a... Um... But then the EU went much further. It started going into the plumbing of the relationship between the EU and Russia. The US and its European allies imposed sweeping new financial sanctions aimed at crippling Russia's economy. 
that economic relationship is really quite integrated. Right. And while everyone knows about uh, Europe's energy dependency on Russia, gas mm -hmm. and oil and so on, the relationship actually goes much deeper than that. It goes into the banking sector. It goes into trade. And so the European Union sanctions really got into the nitty gritty of that relationship. We will paralyze the assets of Russia's central bank. This will freeze its transactions and it will made it impossible for the central bank to liquidate assets. Through the sanctions, the European Union is trying to freeze out the Russian central bank from the global financial system, together with the United States and Canada and Britain, of course. Mm -hmm. This basically cripples the country's ability to finance this war, which is exactly what the Europeans and the Americans want to do. This is They're also stopping their own banks and their own capital markets from doing any kind of transactions with the vast majority of Russian banks and counterparts that until previously were daily interlocutors for European business and banks. I mean, this is really the equivalent of financial shock and awe. But what's also quite important is the non-economic stuff that the European Union has done. For the first time ever, the European Union will finance the purchase and delivery of weapons and other equipment to a country that is under attack. The European Union is mobilizing this sort of obscure fund for the first time in its history to actually purchase and distribute lethal weapons to Ukraine. I'm not talking about helmets and uh, flag jackets or just bullets. I'm talking about rocket-propelled grenades and serious military hardware mm -hmm. that Ukrainians can use to fight Russia. Right, weapons of war. All right, so first remember that the initial Western response to Russia's invasion was weaker. Western allies did not adopt many of the tough sanctions that European countries would impose just days later. At the press conference where he announced these initial more limited sanctions, which was on, was it Thursday on the 24th, President Biden was asked why they were not stronger and he admitted that there was resistance from European allies. So this move by Europe to take a tougher stance against Russia reflects a recent change of heart. Second, this change was led by Europe and not only imposed all the tough sanctions that were promised by the Biden, Biden administration in the run-up to the invasion, but it even exceeded some of those threats. And so we want to briefly outline some of the, the main sanctions that have been adopted by the West. First, Western countries have removed most Russian banks, including the biggest ones, from the SWIFT international banking system. This means that Russian banks will not be able to rely on that authorization and information signals that transmits when to make transfers among banks. Russian banks won't be able to rely on this, uh, this system to accept funds or make payments outside of Russia very easily. There are some caveats here. The West did allow Russia to continue to use the SWIFT system for energy payments because it wants to keep Russian energy flowing to protect its own economies from inflation. But this is still an important and painful sanctions that limits the ability of Russian banks to conduct and finance trade with banks outside of Russia. It's isolating. Yes, tremendously isolating. So second, Europe, the United States, and other countries are now sanctioning the Russian central bank by freezing its overseas assets. This is extremely important because Russia has been working for years to build up foreign currency reserves. And these are holdings of dollars, yen, euros, pounds. And it's using these assets to, in a sense, sanction-proof its economy. So that even if it was shut out of international trade and international markets, it would still have sufficient currency reserves to defend the value of the ruble. So Russia had about a half a trillion dollars, or half a trillion yeah. Dollars in reserves. In reserves. They, were, they weren't all denominated in dollars, but the but value of yeah, yeah, the values of these reserves was a half a trillion dollars that it intended to draw on to withstand Western sanctions. But instead, the West declared financial war and froze these sanctions that are essentially deposited in the central banks of the United States, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank. 
um, the Bank of England. And so now the Russian central bank can't use these assets, which are now frozen, and so they can't w make withdrawals from this five trillion, or sorry, $500 billion account that's, all, that's parked all around the world. Can we pause for a second? Yeah. This was my favorite of the sanctions, if I yeah. can <laughs> call it like that, because it, I mean, the strategy that Russia had was called this Fortress Russia strategy. I mean, they really thought that they could, I mean, this was part of the whole strategy leading up to the uh, Ukraine war and, and really dating back years thinking that someday they're going to be sanctioned even more than they were right after Crimea. And, you know, it wasn't part of any of the threatened sanctions, probably because I, I, I do wonder if they had this in mind all along and then just didn't say it because they didn't want Russia to have time to, to get around it. And then they just froze it. But I, I was shocked. I mean, I don't know. It never occurred to me that they were going to do this. But. Well, and, and so this also has been discussed. I was listening to a podcast about this this morning is this was essentially the nuclear option in financial circles, that it was thought as you couldn't do this, you couldn't freeze the assets of another central bank because it could be so destabilizing to that economy. And so it was eventually, no, this would be mutually costly, we can't do it. And so it was like one of these things you don't talk about. Um, and so that's partly the surprise in that the West went ahead and did it, and the Russian economy and financial system instantly cratered. Yeah. So third, the West has sanctioned powerful individuals, including Vladimir Putin himself and Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, as well as extremely wealthy Russian business leaders known as the oligarchs. This is intended to make Putin and those of his inner circle experience tremendous economic pain in retaliation for Russia's invasion. The hope is that if wealthy Russians with connections at the highest levels of Russian politics to Vladimir Putin lose access to some of their wealth, then they might, might try to change the direction of the war or lobby President Putin to alter the foreign policy of some Russia. Some of them have gone public and said that yeah. there needs to be peace treaty. Now, this one, I think, is a little overblown. I mean, that the, the press kind of, you know, pays a lot of attention to this. I do think it's not a bad idea, but I do, it seems... These, these people aren't going to be bored after these sanctions. And sure, they, I mean, it's, it's tough to watch your wealth dwindle down like that, but, you know, um, it seems a little bit more symbolic than anything. Yeah, and it's designed in terms of the politics and the yeah. symbolic politics here to, to make it seem like the sanctions are targeted so they're not targeted broadly against all of Russian society, even right. though the collapse of the currency will be felt by everyone in Russia. Right. Um, so, so in addition, as a clip from the Daily Notes, Russia has also taken actions outside of official economic sanctions that are meant to raise the cost of Russia's in, invasion, right? What's that? You said Russia. But Russia. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. <laughs> uh, the most important of these actions entails military aid. European countries and the United States and other allies have dramatically increased the flow of armaments to Ukraine to help them defend against the Russian attack. The European Union um, is financing and organizing a lot of this military aid. Most dramatically, Germany has reversed its initial position, refusing to provide Ukraine with weapons, and has joined this effort, reversing a decades-long policy of avoiding transport of weapons to conflict zones. Germany has also dramatically increased its national security budget, marking a substantial change in Germany's Gener general military posture. This is a tremendous, huge change in German politics and European politics more generally. This could have a long, a long term yeah. effect on how Europe defends itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it will ultimately strengthen Europe's independence from the United States right. as well. So this strategy of providing more weapons to Ukraine has some risks. NATO has been very careful to refrain from sending troops to Ukraine to avoid direct military conflict with Russia. Supplying weapons in place of direct military intervention provides a way for the West to influence battlefield outcomes without, hopefully, risking a widening of the conflict so Russia and NATO forces uh, directly engage with each other. However, this is a blurry line. Putin has already made statements warning that he sees arms shipments as, quote, interference 
and may retaliate against countries that provide these arms. Since many of the European countries supplying arms to Ukraine are also members of NATO, this could turn this into a military conflict between Russia and NATO member states. In addition, besides economic sanctions and military aid, European governments and private entities have also taken steps to further isolate Russia. The EU and now the US has banned Russian commercial air carriers from entering their airspace. This has an economic effect, but more importantly, it restricts Russians from being able to travel abroad, which is something that many Russians have come to enjoy and expect. And moreover, there's lots of conversations on Twitter about there's also lots of Russians who want to get out of Russia but now can't do that because they can't fly. So this is also preventing a means for uh, opposition being expressed against the, the Putin's government. The EU has also suspended broadcasting rights for Russian state news agencies, Sputnik and Russia Today, limiting this instrument of Russian propaganda and influence abroad. And there's been a great deal of symbolic cultural isolation. International sport and cultural events that were scheduled to take place in Russian locations have been moved. Russia has been kicked out of the Eurovision music contest, and athletes from Russia and Belarus have been banned from the Paralympics. While hardly as impactful as the economic sanctions or military aid, these steps have an important effect of harming Russia's international reputation and further weakening its ties with Europe and the rest of the world. So just to reiterate, this whole set of actions, harsh economic sanctions, dramatic increase in the flow of weapons and military aid to Ukraine, and a global isolation of Russia from the international community is truly unprecedented. This type of international pressure has been applied to smaller countries, such as Iran, but never to such a large country that has nuclear weapons and that plays such a large role in the international economy. Yeah, it's, it, it is. It, it's um, remarkable and, and it's important to sort of um, highlight that because it, it's not just remarkable, but as I'm going to talk about now, it's, it was unexpected. The first round of sanctions, I mean, Pat, you and I traded a few yeah. texts. We were thinking Putin's going to just get, get away with this without really suffering a lot of damage, but now that's not the case. Yeah. Okay, so... Let's continue then to examine this surprising unity and strength of Europe's reaction to Russia's invasion by placing it in a larger context and trying to explain why the European Union found a way to act collectively and forcefully in this instance when it had been plagued by divisions in so many other crises in the last decade or so or even earlier than that, and when there was some initial reticence even in this crisis. And so we're going to play another cl audio clip from the New York Times, a daily podcast on this issue um, to get us started. So let's go ahead and run that clip now. What looks so significant and unique in this moment is that no one really thought this level of unity and action would be possible, probably Vladimir Putin included. Why not? Why did nobody think that the EU could pull off what it just did? Well, Michael, think about it. It's almost a trope. European Union fragmented, divided. These are the adjectives you always mm. hear associated with the EU. And the reason is it's a club of 27 countries, in fact, that are sovereign right. and have their own interests. And so the relationship with Russia is a single most divisive topic for the European Union's foreign policy. And mm -hmm. EU countries need to have complete unanimity to make any foreign policy decision. Not one can disagree. Absolutely not. Other decisions can be made by simple majority or reinforced majority, but in foreign policy, it has to be every single one of the 27 on board or nothing. Hmm. And so if you think about that, 27 countries, each with a unique relationship to Russia, closer or further away from them, dependent on them for gas and oil and other things, and a demand that they all agree on such an ambitious package of sanctions and measures together with transatlantic partners in Britain, you start realizing how unusual that is. And 
the EU hasn't shown that it can act like that over the last decade. If if we cast our mind back, it's gone from crisis to crisis. Mm -hmm. The Eurozone debt crisis, the migration crisis, then Brexit with Britain leaving the EU, literal fragmentation. Um, really, at no point over the last decade have we seen the bloc really sticking together. All right, so... Uh, let me make a few points here. First, as the clip notes, the quick change within Europe to present this United Fund, we, we can't forget, um, was surprising because of this internal structure of the European Union and its history, particularly over the past decade, uh, this inter set of internal divisions that have hindered the EU from acting as a co cohesive bloc on a number of issues. Um, so the first thing to note is that the EU requires unanimous uh, consent for foreign policy decisions, and that's really hard to achieve. There's, this is a huge and, and quite diverse block of countries, 27 countries in all, and it's, it's hard to get 27 uh, different countries to agree on anything. Um, and so any decision, because there's any one country could be a veto player, uh, really uh, is a hard thing to accomplish. And so the fact that they were able to do this on such a divisive issue and on such a comprehensive set of, of uh, economic sanctions and other actions is, is really kind of uh, astounding. Now, that the internal divisions within the European Union, and this makes this even more surprising, is particularly severe and particularly relevant uh, in the EU's relationship with Russia. There are specific EU countries that have very distinct and sometimes conflicting relationships with Russia. Uh, some countries, like Germany and Italy, have much greater economic interdependence with Russia than other countries, uh, particularly when it comes to energy dependence. And so it is harder for these European countries to get most of their energy from Russia um, and then turn around and take a tough stance against Russian aggression because they have to always be mindful that Russia theoretically at least could cut off their energy supplies if, it's, if it wanted to. And, you know, there is some historical precedent for this. Russia has put pressure on Ukraine, for example, by cutting off an, an, um, energy, right? And so, so this could uh, be a real problem. There's also some cultural and... and, and um, political and historical relationships of countries that, especially if they're closer in geographic proximity to Russia, uh, they tend to have a different relationship than those that are further away. And so, so it's hard to come to any sort of unanimous uh, decision uh, on anything, but it's particularly hard to come to a unanimous decision on what to do with Russia. And, and then finally, there's just these political, economic, and cultural cleavages that have created internal divisions uh, within the EU and, and has po polarized this uh, bloc from acting collectively in, co in a coordinated action uh, for anything. And this has been particularly true over the last decade or so when the EU has been struck by a series of crises and, and it's really shown the internal division. So Great Britain, for example, left the European Union in the Brexit crisis, and so that was a, a huge rupture within the European Union. The international migrant crisis following the wars in Syria and Libya and other parts of Northern Africa and the Middle East created significant divisions between European countries on this issue of uh, migrants. Financial crises in 2009 and during the pandemic created conflict between wealthier countries that had more stable economies like Germany and less stable economies uh, in other parts of Europe that Germany and, and other wealthy countries had to then help to, to rescue. And so, so the EU really isn't a single bloc that easily moves and, and acts. And so that's uh, the context that we need to keep in mind when, we, when we're looking at this uh, really important about face. And so given all the divisions within Europe up to this point and the competing interests within Europe regarding the relations with Russia, the question is why now? Why has Europe united and mobilized now to apply such a harsh set of sanctions in retaliation for Russia's invasion 
to Ukraine. And so let me just offer three reasons that commentators around um, in the media and, and in academia have, have offered here. And so first, and most importantly, I would have to say, is, is Vladimir Putin and Russia inadvertently united Europe through his invasion of Ukraine. And he, I pretty convinced that at least at first when he started this whole process and marshalling a bunch of troops at the border, he thought that he could use this military, threat of military force at least to divide Europe, but instead it, it united Europe. And, and why? It's because it provided European countries with this common enemy. And the Russian invasion transformed really what had been a theoretical Russian threat toward European countries into a very real and immediate threat particularly for those countries in Eastern Europe that had been part of the Soviet sphere of influence during the Cold War, Poland, Romania, Hungary, the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. They have real and relatively recent experience of being subjected to the Soviet hegemony um, and its sphere of influence during the Cold War uh, and their use of military force. And they kind of see this happening again, except in under... Uh, the guys of the Russian government. And so, so that's the first and, and most important uh, reason. Russia brought this about by giving Europe a common enemy to rally behind. Now, second, uh, many of the uh, media reports, and you saw it in the first clip, uh, have uh, said that Europe came together behind sanctions uh, because of the Ukrainian uh, President Volodymyr uh, Zelensky. He uh, and his sort of char charisma, his, his symbolism as the face of Ukrainian opposition to Russian aggression uh, really helped to galvanize and, and mobilize Europe. And so those with insider knowledge of, of one crucial meeting that you saw some uh, uh, clips from uh, the speech that Zelensky gave that, that EU leaders prior to that meeting remain divided over the, some of these key sanctions like taking Russia off of SWIFT or sanctioning Vladimir Putin himself, but then they were persuaded by this impassioned speech given by Zelensky in, in uh, these first days of the invasion. And Zelensky made this um, really plea for strong support from Europe, arguing that U Ukrainians were dying for European values of democracy, freedom, rules-based international order that, that Europe claims to stand for. And, and, and um, a lot of those who have insider knowledge here said that Zelensky did change minds of some crucial European leaders at that key moment. So the second factor is just the dynamic of the invasion, the, the inspiration, if you will, of the Ukrainian resistance, the person in, in Zelensky to, to mobilize and, and galvanize that opinion. And then finally, there's also some commentators who would give some, um, uh, some responsibility and credit to the Biden administration on this and its approach to the Ukrainian crisis. Um, and, and that that approach helped Europe come together. And, the, and Biden uh, took a decidedly multilateral approach uh, the U.S. shared its intelligence with European leaders. Biden regularly met with his counterparts and explicitly told them that the United States could do a lot to confront Russia, but that Europe's role was essential because of the close economic connections between Russia and European countries and, and that, that they had a key role uh, to play. And so in this particular instance, instance I should say, uh, U.S.-led multilateralism, sort of the, the, the Biden doctrine, if you will, of, of trying to, to organize and, and unite a, an alliance of democracies against uh, autocratic aggression that uh, seemed to uh, have worked and, and provided the desired results, at least uh, in this instance and at least for now. So we'll see if it lasts. So now we're going to look at the immediate and future effects of sanctions on the Russian economy. And we're going to start by playing a short clip from the PBS NewsHour on how economic sanctions um, are having significant consequences there. So let's go ahead and run that clip. We have seen, I guess you could say, unprecedented economic uh, sanctions uh, raining down on the Russians. What are you seeing that, and, and how do you see it making a difference in Moscow? 
So it, it, it's not just unprecedented in, in name, it is unprecedented in, in type, in style. Uh, it is, this has never been done. Uh, the entire gen, uh, gen, uh, G7 deciding to sanction the central bank of a major economy never been done at all. Um, whether or not the impact will lead to the outcome that we all want, I think time will tell. There are going to be two levels of this, of this impact. The first we're already seeing, and that's sort of the, the shock and the panic. That's the, 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 the ruble falling by 40 percent. That's the Moscow Stock Exchange seizing up. That's uh, people trying to dollarize assets quickly. That is going to continue, uh, but that will subside to a degree. And then over time, in the space of weeks and certainly months, the broader economic sanctions, both with respect to the central bank, which are very, very impactful, the sanctions with with respect to export controls and otherwise, will start to hit. Uh, and then I think that over time, again, in the space of weeks and certainly months, uh, the, the impact on the, on the economic fortunes of the average Russian, let alone Mr. Putin, I think will start to, to wane significantly. But, but again, this is unprecedented for the world community in this context. So a few comments on this clip. First, as it notes, the economic sanctions had an immediate negative impact on the Russian economy due to widespread panic of Russian citizens and investors. What he means here is that the Russian citizens took actions in anticipation of the future impact of economic sanctions. And these actions resulted in severe and immediate consequences for the Russian economy. So let me just outline some of the most important aspects of this first panic stage. Uh, in Russia. First, the ruble, Russia's currency, lost 30% of its value and hit a record low, 110 rubles to one U.S. dollar, because the Russians rushed to withdraw their money from Russian banks and convert it into hard currency that would hold its value better. Saw lots of lines at ATM machines and shopping malls and the like. And, and if they couldn't um, convert it, they just bought something before the prices went way up or the value of the ruble just went down because it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon to have money that you think is in a matter of hours or days is just going to dissipate in terms of its value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the collapse of the ruble will make everything, but particularly imports, much more expensive. So imagine if the, if the ruble uh, falls in value by 50 percent. What this could mean is imported goods, say, I don't know, a bread or an iPhone or something like this, could double. The cost of that could double in the span of a couple of weeks. So this is what's going on in Russia right now. So in an attempt to stabilize the value of the ruble, the Russian central bank raised the interest rate from 9.8% to 20%. So mortgages in the United States, for a parallel right now, people are worried about the housing market because mortgage rates might go from like three and three quarters percent to 4% or four and a half percent. Yeah. And it has a huge impact when it does that. Yeah, because it dramatically <laughs> raises the borrowing cost. But just think about this. Overnight in Russia, interest rates, and this is the Russian Central Bank, these are interest rates to the best banks, which then charge a premium when they loan out so money. It's even higher. Yes, from 9.8% to 20%. 9.8% is super high. Yeah, 20% is horribly bad, right? Yeah. So this huge increase in the interest rate will make borrowing money in Russia much more expensive, which will lead to a significant contraction in economic growth and likely trigger a severe recession. On top of this, the Russian stock market crashed and has been closed all week. The longest period it's been closed since a financial crisis in 1998. According to a Reuters report, Russian stocks in foreign markets have lost a staggering 98% of their value. 98%. Yeah, uh, losing, well, about $570 billion of market share. So a share would be at 100 is down to two, two bucks. bucks. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, that's wiping out your, yeah. your net worth, your right? Profile. And in a span of a, a, a couple of weeks, and just as a parallel, and I remember we've talked about this before, so a similar thing happened to Russia in 1998. And what that crisis did when the Asian financial crisis spread from Thailand, um, South Korea, and Indonesia, when it spread to Russia, when East Asian demand for oil collapse that led to a cratering in Russian oil prices. The Russian ruble devalued in August of 1998 and I think went from six rubles to a dollar to 18 rubles to a dollar. It had similar effects. The prices of imports tripled. Right. The Russian banking system imploded. But not only that, the middle class in Russia, anybody that had savings built up, they were wiped out. That money was wiped out in a span of three weeks. Right. We're going to probably see something happen 
here in yeah. the context of this crisis. I mean, I was in Russia multiple times in the 90s uh, for dissertation field work and research, and, and, and I saw the whole 90s had various economic crises from hyperinflation to, to this sort of devaluation. And I still remember, it's seared in my memory, I lived in Moscow State University dorm right in the head of bread shop, and, and bread was already high at $15, 15 rubles a loaf, but it didn't affect me because I had hard currency, right? And so by the time I left three months later, it was 150 rubles a loaf. So, now, again, I mean, how does any average Russian, I mean, so, the Russians I knew, they also weren't getting paid from their state jobs for months at a time. So, so think this about this, gonna a be tenfold terrible. increase in food prices. So imagine your Chick-fil-A sandwich yeah. that cost you three eighty dollars today. Imagine it costing you $38 three months from now. Yeah. Um, this is what could happen That's in the Russian inflation. economy yeah. over the next few months. So, and finally, ooh, I need yeah. Russian debt has substantially uh, been downgraded by several ratings agencies and has been labeled junk bond status. This means that international financial markets do not expect Russia to be able to service its debt. They can't use this debt as collateral, or much less likely to be able to use this collateral, which will further weaken the Russian economy and the ability of not only the Russian government but Russian private businesses in the future to borrow in international credit credit markets. So just to reiterate all these developments that have already happened in the first few days of this war, economic sanctions are going to have a long-term impact on the Russian economy. The freezing of foreign assets held in Rus Western countries will reduce Russia's government's ability to pay its bills and to cushion the negative economic consequences of this crisis. So this could include there are going to be reduced salaries for all government workers and state workers and pensions in Russia. And this will have terrible effects on many parts of Russian society, including vulnerable segments such as the elderly. Over the long run, sanctions on technology exports from the West to Russia will harm Russian industry and Russian consumers by preventing Russian firms from obtaining the technology to produce their goods and services and keeping average Russians from obtaining technology such as cell phones, which are going to become much more expensive. All of this means that over the next couple of months and even years, the Russian economy could face a severe and prolonged recession combined with the potential for hyperinflation. This could mean a return to the series of economic crises of the 1990s that predated the rise to power of Vladimir Putin when many Russians went months without getting paid and lost their life savings to hyperinflation. Okay. So, these are really harsh sanctions, and they're going to have a huge impact on Russia. But while the economic sanctions imposed by the West are severe, they're unprecedented, they're going to have real effects, and they've already had real effects. Um, at least for the uh, major global economy like Russia's here, uh, there are some limitations of sanctions that need to be acknowledged. And they were hinted at in this, this clip first. It will take some time for economic sanctions to have their full effects, right? And so after the panic phase, which we're in right now and, and has already had a uh, huge impact, economic sanctions will take weeks or months to really have that effect of sort of drying off the Russian state's coffers. It won't immediately happen. So the Russian state will not immediately run out of hard currency. and. And this is important because the war is in crucial stage, and so this could give the Russian state and the Russian military time to make some military gains over the short term, right? And so, so that's important. This is still, uh, this isn't days, but rather weeks, months uh, of full impact of, of I this. Yeah. Stop for a second here, and and this has implications for what goes on in the battlefield, and also also particularly for how the conflict escalated on Monday, February 28th. So if Putin thinks that he's got a, a limited window right. to execute military victory, then he's going to accelerate his attacks and potentially engage in more attacks on civilian infrastructure to try and break the the Ukrainians' will to resist. And so, in this before paradox, he runs out of resources. Yeah, before he runs yeah. out of resources. So. While there is this desire to, pe to punish Russia, at the same time, the consequences of this could be an acceleration of the temple on the battlefield, which puts more Ukrainian civilians in harm's way. Right. And so, so there is this temporal aspect. The second big thing to note is that the economic sanctions are not 
comprehensive. They don't restrict payments for Russian energy exports. And, and, and this was done for a reason, you know, domestic re political reasons in the West, and, and for good reasons, arguably, that to control inflation here. And so Russian energy and grain exports are exempt from these sanctions. And this provides, though, Russia with a key source of hard currency as a, a stream of income, really. Uh, you know, according to a Reuters report, Russia had um, energy exports that resulted in approximately $500 million worth of resources, income, to the state coffers in Russia per day from energy exports. And this income stream that is still untouched by these sanctions can really help Russia replenish what it lost in all the sanctions um, on its, you know, uh, for, foreign currency re reserves abroad. It's not going to immediately ha allow it to build it up, but it's not as though Russia doesn't have some um, regular income coming in. And so that's going to not so much help the average Russian escape all of the economic pain, it's, but it will, if Putin is determined, provide a stream of income that he can use on the war. And so that's secondly. And finally, the logic really of economic sanctions is that economic pain from sanctions can increase domestic opposition within Russia to the war. And this could really happen, but Putin's regime has also um, used in the past and can use now uh, coercion to remain in power and resist any sort of demands from popular demonstrations or, or uh, mass opposition to this war not to change course. And it's going to use its, all of its, its resources, including the media and, and, and information uh, warfare here, to, to try to make sure that Russians see this as a punishment not from Putin's decisions to go to war, but rather from the West sanctioning what Putin is going to describe to the Russian public as an existential and necessary um, military campaign to protect Russia. So, um, so yeah, those are the limitations. All yeah. right, so now let's move the discussion away from Western economic sanctions to the conflict between the Russian military and the Ukrainian army and civilian resistance. And we're gonna start this discussion by playing a short clip of an interview with a military specialist from the PBS NewsHour on how Russia has fared so far in its attempts to defeat the Ukrainian military and overturn the Ukrainian government. So let's run that clip. Well, Judy, I think we should appreciate that we're in the very early days of what we should expect to be a long protracted military campaign. Clearly, even in these early days, uh, Russia, however, is off its timetables. It has failed, in my view, to sustain momentum in any one of the multiple fronts that they've opened, neither uh, the north, the center, uh, nor the south. Um, my read is that they're recovering from some bad assumptions up front in their military planning. So, for example, the Ukrainians are fighting. Um, the Russian forces, on the other hand, are largely unsynchronized. Um, and, and finally, uh, the West is staying united. There are no fissures in the Western in the Western political and economic sanctions uh, regime. So, so I think that uh, there's some assumptions that they have to recover from. There are capabilities, however, that Russia still has and has not yet employed. Mass fires, including against civilian targets in the cities. They have not shut down the internet. They have not shut down the communications links. They have not turned the lights off in Kyiv. And I expected the, this to be much more brutal in the days ahead. So let me make a couple of points here. First, it's quite clear that Ukrainian resistance has significantly hindered Russia's initial invasion. Some military analysts are arguing that Russia's initial invasion may have been based on poor intelligence and some inaccurate assumptions. Russia sent its ground forces in without first using its substantial advantages in air power, missile attacks, and heavy artillery to first degrade Ukraine's military capabilities. That seems to be due to an expectation that the Ukrainian military would quickly surrender or be defeated by a large number of Russian troops and that the government, the Ukrainian government, that would then quickly collapse. In essence, the Russian military may have anticipated being able to gain control of Ukraine without destroying a lot of its infrastructure and urban centers that they plan to later occupy. 
Now, this has apparently changed the Russia's military timetables and means that they are behind schedule. They have not captured cities as quickly as the Russians had planned, and this is producing logistical and morale pro problems in the Russian army. We can't know for sure, but the fact that the 70-mile convoy of military equipment outside of Kyiv, Ukraine's capital, has stalled seems to indicate that the invasion has not gone according to plan. They're running out of gas, their tires are getting punctured, um, they can't move. This is, these are significant logistical challenges that are slowing the success of the campaign. Strong Ukrainian resistance has had other important effects that have damaged Russia's military goals. The surprising success of Ukrainian resistance has galvanized global public opinion and helped the Ukrainian government and notably President Zelensky as the face of the Ukrainian resistance to control the narrative in Ukraine's favor and public information coming out in favor of Ukraine. One cannot deny that stories of the Ukrainian resistance on Western media outlets and social media have inspired many around the world and swung global public opinion sharply in Ukraine's favor. Now, this psychological effect has helped Zelensky put pressure on Western governments, particularly in Europe, to provide more support, both in terms of economic sanctions and greater Western military aid. Ukraine has even asked to be invited into the European Union and now created a domestic political challenge on the part of European leaders of having to say no to him while they're in the midst of this crisis. So early Russian struggles on the battlefield have also undermined Russia's attempt to control the narrative both internationally and within Russia. Russian state media, of course, has not aired news of the successes of the Ukrainian resistance, but this has not kept information from the battle making it to Russians online. Moreover, the Russian state strategy quickly adopted a strategy of information blackout with news outlets not really covering the invasion and not referring to it as an invasion, an attack, or a war. Military operations, yeah. I believe, is the term. This approach further undermined Russia's ability to frame the conflict in its terms as protecting Russian speakers from attack by the Ukrainian government and protecting Russia from the threat posed by NATO. However, these initial Ukrainian military successes do not mean that Russia has lost this war. The Russian military can adapt, and it already is. Unfortunately, Russia's adjustments to its current battlefield mistakes and setbacks have meant more attacks on civilians and much more devastating attacks on major Ukrainian cities. Russia has already started to escalate the level of coercion by using more artillery and targeting again against civilian populations. The biggest fear is that Russia could resort to even more destructive attacks by using aerial bombardment to destroy Ukrainian cities as it did in wars against Chechnya or Syria. In those wars, the Russian military used its air force to completely destroy whole cities. This could allow Russia to achieve its military objectives, but at huge human costs to Ukraine. Of course, this will mean even more global condemnation, but Putin may have calculated that he doesn't have to lose much more at this point because he's already isolated and facing harsh sanctions. Yeah, it's really important to stress that, that the dynamic here, if, if, if Putin really doesn't think he has much more to lose in terms of retribution, um, his restraint is going to be weakened. Yeah. So, okay, let's end now with a short... Uh, discussion of U.S. Um, uh, domestic politics within the United States and how Ukraine fits into that. And so we're going to start with a, our last clip, a, a short one from uh, President Biden's State of the Union address. So let's run that now. Throughout our history, we've learned this lesson. When dictators do not pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos. They keep moving. And the cost, the threats to the America and America to the world keeps rising. That's why the NATO alliance was created, to secure peace and stability in Europe after World War II. The United States is a member, along with 29 other nations. It matters. American diplomacy matters. American resolve matters. Putin's latest attack on Ukraine was premeditated and totally unprovoked. He rejected repeated, repeated efforts at diplomacy. He thought the West and NATO wouldn't respond. He thought he could divide us at home in this chamber and this nation. He thought he could divide us in Europe as well. But Putin was wrong. 
We are ready. We are united, and that's what we did. We stayed united. We prepared extensively and carefully. We spent months building coalitions of other freedom loving nations in Europe and the Americas, to, from America to the Asian and African continents, to confront Putin. Like many of you, I spent countless hours unifying our European allies. We shared with the world in advance what we knew Putin was planning and precisely how we would try to falsify and justify his aggression. We countered Russia's lies with the truth. And now, now that he's acted, the three free world is holding him accountable, along with 27 members of the European Union, including France, Germany, Italy, as well as countries like the United Kingdom, Canada, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and many others, even Switzerland, are inflicting pain on Russia and supporting the people of Ukraine. Putin is now isolated from the world more than he has ever been. All right. So uh, let me just make a couple of points. I, we wanted to show that clip just to kind of show the context of the State of the Union. But the Russian invasion really changed this whole speech because it, it changed the, the narrative and the dynamic for uh, President Biden. He was going into this speech having to talk a lot about inflation and, and other really divisive issues. And this um, invasion, like in Europe and how it galvanized European uh, opinion has also had an impact in, in, in sort of uniting uh, public political opinion and political elites in the United States, at least in part, around this mission to um, confront Russia against Ukraine. Not completely, right? There's still some outliers, including former President Trump, that is making statements that aren't quite on the same page as the Biden administration and much of the political um, Rep elected representatives, but it, it is this this bipartisan moment, and, and it's the most bipartisan moment in his whole State of the Union address. He got the strongest applause. He got the most support from both sides of the aisle, so to speak, for his um, comments about the United States standing behind Ukraine, standing with its European allies to confront uh, Russia. And so he he did, again, use this opportunity in the State of the Union address to kind of hammer home not just to Congress but and, and uh, other uh, political elites, but also to the American public that this is a, a contest between democracy and autocracy. And he, he emphasized um, quite strongly the value of NATO and multilateralism uh, in facing these aggression, this aggression from uh, an auto autocratic regime in Russia. And so, so it was another opportunity to try to build a bipartisan um, coalition, if you will, in uh, support of this mission to confront Russia. And so let's, uh, there, there's one more uh, element of this that I just want to touch on before we just close, and that is American public opinion. And so let's uh, look at that. Th three weeks, uh, this invasion has affected U.S. public opinion. So three weeks ago, three weeks before the invasion, there were more Americans who said that the United States should remain neutral, 49% said that, uh, than side with Ukraine, which only 46% um, said that. But now, in the midst of the invasion, th this survey was kind of right at the, the edge of that, um, there are twice as many respondents uh, in the United States who want to side with Ukraine, 57 percent, then argue uh, the United States should uh, remain neutral, which is at 25 percent. So this is a huge shift, right, in favor of Ukraine. And the other thing to note here from this slide is the partisan differences on uh, sanctions, the, the, the primary policy of uh, the Biden administration here, um, are real, but they're relatively small. 79% of Democrats support the use of sanctions. 62% of Republicans also support the sanctions. So a majority in both parties support using sanctions to um, retaliate against uh, Russia for the invasion of Ukraine. And, and another survey that's not on peers said that even if it raises Gasoline prices, 50% of respondents said that they would still 
uh, be in favor of these sanctions. And so, so there is this sort of movement. And this is, this is a real change from just a few weeks ago because Republicans were much less in favor of that kind of action than uh, they are now. But, and this is the last point I want to make, this is, there, there, there remains a huge partisan gap um, when it comes to perceptions of President Biden's handling of the Ukraine crisis. Th those differences are uh, huge, right? 66% of Democrats approve of how Biden has handled uh, this crisis and this conflict, and 75% of Republicans disapprove. And so, so it's interesting because you've got majority support for the policy that's being followed, but then this disjuncture, and, and, and uh, at least on the Republican side, um, a strong majority of who disapprove of Biden's handling of this. Independents are also largely in the majority of, of disapproval on how Biden has handled this. And so, so there's something to continue to watch. All right. Okay. Well, yeah. I think that's it. Yes, that's for this, it. I suspect, are you going to make any commitments this no, time about I, what we're going to talk about? Who knows what's going to happen, man. Uh, we'll probably be talking about this again in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Pretty safe bet. I'd say so. All right. Uh, have a good weekend, good week, good spring break. Yeah, spring break's coming up. And uh, we'll see you next time. Okay.